Hello everyone, welcome to the fifth episode of the Cloud Security Lounge. Today with Isa, we are glad to welcome Chris Ferris. Hi Chris, I think you are um, a cloud security expert, right? You are consultant with Prime Harbor. You, you even say cloud security nerd. And you're the organizer of the, of the Forward Cloud Sec uh, Conference, which keeps growing in, a, in popularity. Uh, welcome, Chris. Uh, thank you. So just as clarity, I, I am one of many organizers of the Forward Cloud Sec Conference. And so I don't want to claim that this is, is my effort. Uh, we have an awesome team of volunteers that, that help us uh, put the conference on, select the talks, uh, organize the audiovisual and, and everything else. So, um, but yes, thank you for having me. Um, and yeah, I, I do uh, cloud security consulting, uh, trying to help uh, particularly smaller companies uh, get out of what I often find is the, the, the dumpster fire of, hey, we didn't know better, or hey, we started this many years ago and best practices have evolved, but we mm -hmm. haven't had the effort and time to do that. So um, I find it's a very interesting niche that allows me to uh, help companies move forward, uh, update, modernize, uh, because, you know, cloud's been around now for a while. It has, it has. And so before we deep dive into uh, all your uh, knowledge, extensive and historical knowledge of, uh, of cloud breaches, would you mind sharing a bit about Forward CloudSec? I think it's happening uh, soon, the 2023 edition. What, yeah, what are so you especially excited about? I suspect by the time this uh, podcast goes to air, we will uh, already be done and you'll be able to see all of our uh, episodes on our website. Uh, that's forward CloudSec, fwdcloudsec.org. And we'll share um, the link with the, yeah. along with mm -hmm. the recording. And um, so, uh, yeah, we're uh, getting on a plane tomorrow to uh, head out to Anaheim. Uh, like last year, we're co-hosting or co-locating, I should say, with uh, AWS Reinforce. And uh, yeah, we're going to have a day and a half worth of talks. Uh, and then Tuesday afternoon, we'll actually have a uh, incident response game day hosted by uh, uh, Rich Bogle and Will Bengston. Um, and yeah, so uh, I'm very much looking forward to it and I'm very much looking forward to um, it being over and then me having some some downtime where I'm not <laughs> scrambling to figure out, hey, do we have food trucks or, you know, what's the catering situation look like? <laughs> are the badges printed and, and everything? And so what what uh, are the big trends you are excited about uh, at uh, Forward CloudSec this year? Yeah. So our, our theme this year is blurring lines. Uh, and what we're discovering is that while cloud security infrastructure, VPCs, IAM, public S3 buckets, and all of that have been a consistent pattern of cloud security challenges. Uh, we're seeing the, the, the line blur between what is cloud security and what is application security, um, what is product security. Um, in fact, mm -hmm. a, a lot of my coworker or colleagues are now finding themselves in roles where product security, application security, and cloud security are all rolling up into sort of the same leader. Um, and so with the, the these lines blurring, it's not just about traditional CSPM infrastructure stuff. It's, hey, how do I get from code repo through a pipeline to production or to, to the cloud provider, whether regardless of what environment it is, uh, and how do you do that securely? And we've spent many years focusing on the cloud provider piece, tracing it back through the pipeline, back to the source code repository. That, that's a new area of cloud security that is now starting to get a, a lot of attention, even though we've seen numerous breaches related to that that have all hit on that, uh, hit on that source code and pipeline part. Okay. And, and uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Actually, JP, sorry. Uh, so you, you, when you're putting together a conference, uh, uh, a lot of times you get into the uh, getting submissions and going through them and deciding who's going to present, who's not. It's a very hard work. So thanks for all the the conference uh, organizers out there. I recently had the the experience to do it, and uh, one of the things that I found uh, uh, hard is that 
the variety of uh, of submissions that you get. Many times what you get is like almost marketing or almost somebody trying to subreptitiously use your conference to sell you something, but those those are, are cases that uh, are, are easy to clear. The submissions that you're seeing, are you happy with the, the first of all, the number? Are, are you getting enough people oh, coming? We're getting, we're, we're, get, we're, we're getting too much almost. I think we oh, have awesome. like 200 submissions for something like 30 some odd slots. Well, wow, for a day and a half, 30, 30 yeah, slots? For, for a day and a half. And for, uh, I think, about 10 or so reviewers, um, mm -hmm. that ends up being a lot of submissions to, to review. I would say that we're not getting blatant marketing. Um, mm -hmm. Previous years, we've definitely seen a couple of, okay, this is definitely blatant marketing. A, a third-party PR firm has done the submission. Mm-hmm. Uh, this year, we basically said, you know, presenters have to do their own submissions. We got a lot of those. Um, we, we got a lot of good, I should say, um, uh, presenter submitted sessions. I'm more now at this point wanting to see actual practitioners mm -hmm. uh, who are doing the work rather than, uh, you know, I, I think... If we think about shared responsibility, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff that happens on the cloud provider side. But me as a cloud security leader in my organization, uh, me as an individual contributor in my organization, there's not much I can do about cloud security vulnerabilities other than um, support it when somebody else discloses that and, you mm -hmm. know, make the cloud security provider or the cloud provider closes them. But I'm not going to be able to say, oh, look, we found all these vulnerabilities in Azure. Let's migrate out of Azure to Oracle Cloud. You know, th that's <laughs> not something that anybody is going to do as a result of that. What we can do is what falls on our side of the shared responsibility or shared fate model, which is make sure that our buckets are secure, our I, you know, IAM principles are least privilege. Uh, that you know, we're not opening network ports to the world. All of those things we can control, and that's what we really need to be focused on. It's fun to look at. Hey, we figured out how to leverage this service to get behind the the multi-tenant cloud plane to then bounce around to this other service and see this other customer's data. That's fun. Um, it's fascinating. Uh, it appeals to the cloud security nerd in me, but it's not something I can do anything about other mm -hmm. than just say, okay, I'm moving back on-prem because cloud's not secure. And that's not true. On-prem is just as um, insecure. So, so if, you, if you had one piece of advice based on, on the 200 plus submissions that you saw, to the people who may be listening, who are thinking about, oh, that looks like an interesting conference, I would like to go and submit something, one thing that you very quickly would like to, to tell the, those people. If you're a practitioner, if you're working at a company and you're doing cloud security or even things now that are somewhat adjacent to cloud security, like CI CD pipeline security or source code security, please submit. Um, I would say that, you know, about two thirds of our submissions came from securities uh, vendors. Uh, we did not get as much practitioner-focused material as we wanted, and we're a practitioner-focused conference. So this year, to encourage more practitioners, we're covering hotel rooms for uh, uh, speakers. Uh, next year, it is my hope that our generous sponsors, who um, really do make this show happen, the ticket price barely covers the, the, the meals we give, but the generous sponsors come forward again and allow us to say, for all of our practitioner speakers, we can cover your travel cost. Awesome. We'll Thank happens. you. Looking forward to the conference. Yep. Same. I'm very excited about the blurring the line uh, yeah. theme. And very. Yes. Sir. I think and, and lastly, you know, we are both. Uh, a in-person and live streamed event. Uh, so regardless where you are in the world, you can tune in live. Good. By the time you see this, all of our, our sessions probably are up on uh, YouTube, uh, on our website. 
And if you have feedback for us, the organizers, um, whatever, the Cloud Security Forum Slack, which you can find a link to on forwardcloudsec.org, um, will uh, you know allow you to engage with uh, the organizers and the, the you know speakers and everybody else. Again, we'll share the, the link in the episode yes. notes. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> so blurring blurring the lines. Are you so you you you're working on um on a project uh, that is called Bridges that Cloud, on which you uh, you enumerate a lot of uh, bridges that happen through cloud. Uh, and so, just before we deep dive into into that one, is uh, like bl blurring the lines. Is it something that you you see today as as a consequence of uh, or as a cause? Of, uh, of attacks, misconfigurations, uh, how, how does that uh, practically relate uh, as, as, a, as something that uh, as practitioners in the industry we might, we might face? So I think with blurring the lines, what we're, what we're going for here is it's not just about the cloud infrastructure security, right? Um, it is about the whole, how do you get things and deployed in the cloud? You, you move. You put the blurring the lines concept in, in, in terms of going from AppSec up to the public cloud deployment and, and securing and all that. So I, I have to ask this. Is it what we're calling DevSecOps this week? Um, <clears throat> probably a little bit of that. Um, uh -huh. DevSecOps also talks a, a lot deeper about what's happening at the application layer, at the data mm -hmm. layer in the cloud service provider. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, if, if you're using infrastructure as code in public cloud, then your, your infrastructure is developed like an application. Mm -hmm. So it needs to have a DevSecOps process that that's similar to that. So you, you are putting in the blurring the lines, you are bringing the application developer much closer to that to what we what we called up to today the DevSecOps. Yeah, well I think DevOps sort of in a way brings the developer closer to the infrastructure. That that has been mm -hmm. the promise of it's no longer write code, throw it over the wall, the sysadmin team, sysadmin team deploys it kind of thing. So um you know now yes we're bringing the SAC into the, the DevOps piece, but we're also bringing the dev into the ops piece, right? And the SecOps piece. So more and more security professionals need to sort of be developers too, right? You know, we're- Oh, that's interesting. Because we have to automate the cloud. We have to automate fixing things. We have to automate, what do we do with 100,000 CSPM findings and 200,000 AWS inspector findings? You know, in a lot of places, yes, we can go out and we can buy a product, um, but not everybody can afford a product. And, you know, in a lot of cases, the, it, it's, a, let me pause right here. In, in, in my experience, it, there's, how do you collect the data? And how do you present the data to make it actionable? Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of companies out there that really help on the collecting the data. How do you make it actionable? Ends up being a very specific to your organization problem yep. to solve. Um, you know, certain organizations, they can just say, hey, here's a list of problems, go fix them. Uh, other organizations need lots and lots of handholding by the security team in order to go in and say, okay, so this is what you need to do, or here's where the, you know, the source code is, you, this is the line that you need to change from encryption equals false to encryption equals true. Mm -hmm. So, uh, crap, now I forgot the whole question. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you, you, you're going great. I think that you're bringing me to a place where now we are seeing security practitioners in the cloud in this blurred line thing. If I understand you correctly, being much more responsible for the, the programmatic glue that's bringing all this data that we have 
into the face of the developer, the guy that had, who's doing DevOps, DevSecOps, and, and all that good stuff. So it's my experience is application uh, security, mo like most of my experience. So the whole question of do you have to know how to code for the security pr practitioner was more or less explained and, and accepted. And now you are bringing me from the other side of the pipeline saying, hey, you've been doing all these infrastructure things, and now you have to know how to code so that you can bring everything together. That that's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, and I think that, and I think in a lot of cases, the security, the tooling we buy in security, is geared towards the security team because we're the ones who are, you know, doing the procurement, yeah. writing the check. Um, but we need to get that data in the hands of the developers who are actually uh, implementing the fixes, and that's where the sort of that that gap still exists. Mm -hmm. You're not paying me for this plug, but there are certain tools that are moving into the security space that are already in front of the developers on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and that's a very interesting thing for security practitioners to start looking at is, are the tools my developers using, the tools that maybe we should be using from a security perspective? That, that's insightful, yeah. Yes, and uh, I love that. Uh, Isar, don't you don't you feel that's like the the pitch of most of our product brief uh, <laughs> initially? Look at at the end of the day. I, I mean, I didn't want to say anything, right? But uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. it feels yeah, yeah. It, it, it yes. feels like you're telling us, hey, continue doing what you're doing. <laughs> but so to, to to be honest, that's also because and and uh, after we are done talking about that log, unless if you want to to share about the. The, the old data log breach, uh, of course, uh, Chris, but basically the, um, uh, when you say security vendors, well, uh, data log is not like uh, a, a traditional security vendors because we came from observability, right? And so uh, <laughs> what we build naturally is more directed at DevOps or, 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 or those persona rather than um, security professional. And so that's almost like the, the opposite uh, um, Step you're coming from the opposite to make. side, right? You're coming in from tools that developers know and love, rather than a security company coming in with tools that security kn knows and loves, and then trying to make those for, um, you know, make those palatable to, to the development community. I think the big thing that I always like to talk about whenever I'm, you know mentoring my team or whatever else in, in a security role is, we have to be able to articulate the risk to developers. If we say, well, policy says we need to go and do this. So sorry, you're gonna lose your weekend to go and shut take down our application, shut down our RDS database and restore it because you didn't collect the encryption button. Um, you know, they're gonna wanna know what's the risk. And yeah. outside of, hey, some bureaucrat somewhere is going to, you know, give you an audit finding because you didn't check the box. That's not really, I mean, auditors can be a threat actor in, in certain situations, <laughs> um, but they're typically not ones that developers are thinking about. I would much rather be talking to developers about, so, hey, if you go read the book Sandworm by Andy Greenberg, you'll see exactly how this attack played out. And so what you yeah. want to do is not do X, Y, or Z. Yes. And now I've um, given you the segue to... <laughs> well, so maybe be even before the segue, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm an optimist by nature. And when I hear you saying uh, now uh, cloud security is not as... Uh, it's probably more nuanced than it once was right uh, and and when you say lines are blurring yes of course if if you want to uh, get initial access into a, um, a given cloud uh, account it, it it might not be as easy today as it was 10 years ago and and so what is um, making me pretty uh, hopeful about security here is that yes of course the security posture of the cloud service providers improved right uh, it's harder for users to make a, a mistake now we have best practices that are start to be well known and applied everywhere we moved from 
uh, click, click, click to uh, Terraform, right? Things that are like reviewable, auditable, uh, Terraform or infrastructure as code at, at large. So I, I, and that's something that we consistently see consistently see in, uh, in security. If you think about uh, how you were building web applications 30 years ago and how it's done uh, today, well, uh, the, the, the risk have completely shifted away from the like underlying infrastructure up to the, to the business logic. And, and somehow the business logic of the cloud is also the, the, the application. Uh, and and so yeah, that that's that's that resonates uh, deeply uh, to me. And but on the other hand, it's I think it's expected, just as with the the any technology that is maturing. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. And and I think that that is what the the, the goal of serverless is. Right, is the cloud provider itself is doing lots and lots of the high end business logic. And now we need to understand how to secure those various pieces of that high-end business logic that, that the cloud provider is providing us. Mm -hmm. Yes, fully fully aligned. Um, it's it's yeah. <laughs> serverless is the. So when you say serverless, I'm 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 very tainted with Lambda, but obviously that that goes much beyond that. Uh, um, yeah, you might say Fargate I mean, or like simple yeah. container. Well, but even S3 is in a way serverless, right? It's, hey, I need to store some data. And so I just put it there. And I don't think about the underlying servers of S3. I just have a bucket mm -hmm. and I put something in it. I mean, that, that is an almost, API. That, that is almost the complete definition of totally managed, I don't have to think about it, uh, infrastructure. Um, and then that glues into something like AWS recognition, which takes the pictures out of the bucket does some AI magic on it, and then gives you a JSON file with, with that magic, which I think also goes back into a bucket. So, you know, almost with no code outside of the Terraform to, to do that, you now have an image uh, uh, catalog, catalog categorization system. And you, you wrote almost no code outside of that Terraform. Yeah, the, the bit that kills me there is the, I almost don't have to think about it. Because as we're going to see soon in your in your site, yes, you do have to think about it because there's a lot of cracks in the middle that things can fall through. And then uh, there's the other. Yep. But, yeah. Exactly. And and yes, that S3 is a great example of I don't have to think about the servers, but I have to think about all of the different configuration options. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And, and it's good to see that uh, finally S3 has migrating towards something like uh, secure by by default. With now you get it encrypted by from the yeah. start, right? You don't have to click. You have to unclick the button if you don't want it. And and yeah. I think a lot of it goes back to S three particularly was M one of Amazon's first first services. So this whole concept of ACLs, which they have finally deprecated by well, they haven't deprecated it. They've turned it off by default. Was what existed before IAM existed. So. There, there's an entire legacy pile of, I don't want to call it tech debt, but at least backwards compatibility that needs to exist in S3, that if they were implementing S3 today would just not be there. Um, and so it's kind of fascinating talking to folks who work in that space, what they have to do to kind of both support places that were, you know, rolling out S3 in what, 2009? Uh, versus what the companies want today for from a security perspective. So is that it's our almost... segue? Oh, sorry, is that <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. Let Let's say in that. Otherwise, I can go for hours on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so Chris, um, about um, breaches that cloud. Would you like to share a bit more about that that project of yours? Sure. So this actually came up when. I was flipping through Twitter or my newsfeed or whatever, and I saw a reference to an indictment and, you know, the, the Department of Justice press release basically just said company one. And I'm like, I recognize the name of this person, but I don't remember what it was. And so I kind of either asked in Twitter or in Slack and they were like, oh yeah, you're, you're thinking of the, the ubiquity case. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah, that's right. That's right. And then I realized that I see so many different 
stories of breaches related to cloud security that I no longer can keep them clear in my own head. Um, now, maybe that's old age, but um, I said, you know, Rami McCarthy's got this great uh, list of cloud security breaches, but it's it's kind of like just this one happened and here's a news article to it. It doesn't really allow me to see the story as it evolves over time. And so I was like, okay, I need something that's basically a Wikipedia of cloud security breaches. Something okay. that kind of allows me to go back and say, ah, Nicholas Sharp, right. That guy was part of Ubiquity's case. Um, and what was the deal with, ah, right, okay, got it. Taking the, the, the logging data and putting a one-day lifecycle retention policy on it, that was pretty creative. Good for him. Um, too bad, you know, he's been indicted or sentenced or, or whatever it was at the time. I, I think he pled guilty. Um, so I was like, all right, let's 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 take this list from Rami and actually build it out into, here's a detailed breakdown of what happened. Here's the timeline of what happened. And that timeline is ever evolving as we learn new details about specific cases. Um, you know, the, the criminal justice system does its thing. It looks almost like uh, NTSB reports of uh, public cloud breaches. Like um, that's an interesting way to look at it. Um, I definitely wanted to kind of do a little bit of the incident response uh, process, uh -huh. right? You know, so what happened? What was the timeline? What did we learn from it? You know, and in a lot of ways, the, the details that we get um, dribble out over time. Uh, in, in many cases, maybe all we have is the... Uh, you know, victims breach disclosure notice. In other cases, hey, you know, this person is going to court. Okay, now we've got court transcripts and indictments that we can look at. Um, you know, class action lawsuits also sometimes have details about what happened. And then we kind of have to like translate when somebody says an S3 database. What does that mean? Does that mean like a SQL file in an S3 bucket? Are they just referring to S3 itself as a key value database? Um, you know, because again, these are lawyers and law enforcement writing these things, not cloud professionals. So you, you base yourself all on public information. You don't go back to these people and talk to them to get more behind the story or anything like that. You, you're basically okay. collecting everything that's out there. So I'm collecting what's public record. Uh, I don't want to get insider information because that means somebody's violating their NDA. And the last thing I need is a company saying, hey, where did you get this fact? And now I'm in the you know, position of, well, gee, such and such told me. And so now you're going to go run them through the legal coals. I don't want to do that. So we're, we're sticking to publicly reported information. Um, or, uh, you know, uh, public sources like court transcripts, FTC complaints, whatever. Um, and the interesting thing about the court transcripts are is they're not free. Um, mm. They are like 10 cents a page. And these, court, some of these, yeah, and some of these court cases go on for days and days and days. So it could cost me three to $6,000 to potentially go and pull the transcript for the Capital One incident. Mm-hmm. So that that's a lot of money to drop just to kind of get that bit of information and only then to find out what information was actually brought up in trial. Because um, there's a lot of other drama that happens in a lot of these cases that is quasi tangential to what were the cloud security mistakes that the company made. Um, and you know, go ahead. Off the top of your head, do you remember how many incidents you have in there right, right now? And, and maybe it's time for screen sharing and and uh, and, and getting to your uh, to the website, Chris. Yeah, looking at it. Uh, Fourteen of them, uh, according to. Fourteen. Yep. Yeah. Um, What's interesting are... to me? Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say there are a lot more that we haven't yet categorized. These are the ones that had the most information available on mm -hmm. them. 
Um, you know, uh, the one that's missing still is Capital One. So much ink has been uh, spent on Capital One. I basically wanted to get those court transcripts and, and really do a good deep dive on Capital One before we published it. Mm. The, the one thing I, I like to do in, in the sort of uh, information or, or, or sites or stuff like that is look at the tags and see if there's any kind of pattern, any kind of uh, thing that, that jumps to the eye in there. And in the tags that you have in here, it's it's almost funny that, not funny, but it's almost clear that you see a, a, a lot of uh, key secrets, mishandled secrets, the 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 idea of secrets that were either misshared or or mishandled jumps very easy to the eye in this yeah. 14, uh, 14 cases. That, that's so, pretty interesting by itself. Yeah. So I, I got I hired two uh, college students to kind of help me do a, a lot of the googling and the research and and initial write ups of of all of this. And one thing that we all quickly noticed was it always seems to be access keys in a source code repository. Um, and sometimes it's a public source code repository. Sometimes it's a private source code repository, but you know, um, in, in the case of like Uber, it was the first one was in a public repository, uh, back in 2014, back before we, we kind of really knew that that was a, um, a threat vector. And then in 2016, the follow-up case was, okay, they cred stuffed a Uber engineers GitHub, and suddenly now they're uh, getting secrets out of private GitHub repos. Um, I can't remember, there's a, a number of others, but it does end up being a lot of uh, keys in GitHub uh, that, that generally tend to uh, lead to the bigger ones. And then you have things like LastPass that, if I remember correctly, it was some developer's laptop that got breached and the credentials were there and from there to the whole thing. Well, and LastPass was an interesting one because LastPass was a two-phased attack. Um, you know, they got in through a, a laptop of a person through, I, I think it was just maybe probably a generic phishing attack. Um, they managed to get source code and they thought, okay, well, they got the source code, but things are, you know, okay. Um, but then the attacker reappeared later in the year and suddenly it was like, oh, hey, you know, they found some secrets and they were able to use those to go download the database backups. And so then they, 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 found the, they found the secrets in uh, like... The secrets were put in the source code later. Do, do we know exactly? Uh... So, per LastPass's disclosure, some of these source code repositories included clear text, embedded credentials, stored digital certificates, okay. um, and, and encryption capabilities for backups. So, um, they they did that, and then they figured out who to target and kind of spearfished a high level engineer which was then a through that high level engineer's personal roku device in their house and use that mm. to give it yes yeah so this is like a a spear phishing attack against a consumer device that was used to pivot into a high, priv, highly privileged engineer's environment to then go and ex well, they, yeah, get credentials. Um, yeah, so they hit a highly privileged engineer's home media server and used that to then install Keylogger on the uh, their workstation, which they then used to uh, exfiltrate the credentials needed to download the backups, which they then knew that they could decrypt from the first attack. Weakest link, huh? It's always the weakest link. Yeah. Yes, but it's also a lot of links here. So, so what, what's the, do you, do, do we know the motivation of the, of the attacker or is there like, a... um, we don't know the motivation of the attacker. One of the things about breaches.cloud is I wanted to not speculate a lot. Mm. Um, but 
let let's face it, it's LastPass. I think we kind of know what they were going for, right? <laughs> um, I think the the interesting bit of speculation is who the heck was behind this? Because um, this was a very advanced kind of attack, and nobody has said nation state or APT, but you know, over beers, I'm going to say, yeah, this was probably a nation state or APT um, to get in, analyze all of that source code. And now, I mean, it took them from uh, August to December uh, to to do that analysis. Uh, but actually, from the, the second breach notification, they quickly said, what, the, the threat actor was actively engaged in a new series of reconnaissance, enumeration, and exfiltration against the cloud storage environment, almost from the beginning of that first exfiltration event. Um, so they knew they had gotten something, and they were going to continue pressing the offensive uh, against this company. And do you know if at least the beat in August 12, when they say that there was unusual activity in the development environment, that, that that's fine. Okay, we, we found something strange in here. Mm -hmm. But then from August 12 to October 26th, then there was reconnaissance, enumeration, and exfiltration activities aligned to the cloud storage environment. Yep. Do you know if that beat was actively uh, observed or if it was looking back forensically and, yeah, we found traces? Or did they actually see that happening as it happened? I would have to go back to the, um, go back to the breach notification. I don't think they knew at the time that that was happening. Um, mm -hmm. And again, a lot of the, the analysis could have also been being done offline because they had the source code, right? right. So it's an occasional poke here, an occasional poke there. Um, and then, you know, I mean, and it's easy enough to identify spear phishing targets through something like LinkedIn. Hey, senior DevOps mm -hmm. engineer, um, you know. So I, I, I suspect that's what happened. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head. But it's, it's still, you, you, you pointed an interesting uh, aspect that there was a very strong case here to say, somebody with at least an intelligence background or experience or anything like that yeah. was orchestrating this whole thing and knowing let's go for this level and then let's go for this level of access. Yeah. It's... Yeah. And, and, and that kind of goes back to what I like to talk to everybody about, which is what's, what's your corporate threat model? You know, mm -hmm. where are, if somebody were to go after you, what would they go after you for? If somebody were to rattle a door handle and find themselves suddenly, oh, hey, look, I can walk on in, um, you know, where are they going to go and in your environment and poke around looking for stuff? It's almost um, like you're telling people to threat model. <laughs> yeah, but it's not just threat model the application. It's threat model the, no, the whole thing. Business. Yep. Um, and, and it's that business level threat modeling of, you know, what are your important assets? What would somebody target you for? What would somebody find if they just started rummaging through, you know, the shed in your backyard kind of thing? Mm -hmm. um, and then it was like, oh, well, I keep all my expensive power tools in the shed in my backyard. Hmm. Let's go monitor that, um, you know, rather than, oh, well, I've got this great home alarm system, but all my valuables are in the shed. Which goes against uh, again to the, the blurring of the lines, right? It's not yep. only a threat modeling in that little piece there. It's like, look at the whole thing holistically and, and find your crown jewels, find everything that can happen to it and find where the copies of the crown jewels are and protect that as well. Well, yep. and, and in previous roles I've had, so I, I was at a large media company um, that did everything from cartoon to, uh, you know, cable news. And, you know, with a... Uh, generally a flat network and all being in one company, you know, is is this one cartoon game site potentially a path into this completely separate, um, you know, business line, you know, and that was things that we, we were concerned about. And that was mm -hmm. part of that, going back to that articulating of risk is, hey, you know, you've got a vulnerability over here and it's not just your thing that's vulnerable you are exposing the entire broader organization. 
Um, and one of the things about, and one of the goals of breaches.cloud is to be able to say with concrete examples of, look, I get it, you like working from home, but don't run your Plex Media server on your work laptop, because if you do, you know, that's how LastPass got hacked kind of thing. And if we can now get to the point of using concrete, explicit examples that people know about, rather than hypotheticals, well, you know, you can't do this because the Russians might get in, or you can't do this because, you know, Section 24601 of our information security policy says, you know, all databases must be encrypted. It becomes a very different uh, conversation. It's much more about that articulating of risk, explaining to developers the why, and not just saying, go do it because we said so. Yeah, in, in my experience, developers are, are an extremely smart bunch, and they like to know the reason for stuff. And just coming and saying, hey, there is risk. So you can't do that. There is risk. The next right. question is, says who? What's the risk? Exactly. What How is big the is the risk? And that's the hard part to quantify that thing. But when you put examples like this clearly articulated, as you said, and a developer can, can read it in language that they immediately recognize and understand, this is invaluable. Yeah. And that's, and that's the goal, is really to be able to give us that, that a database of risk that we can articulate, saying that, hey, I know you're in a hurry. You've only you know, put three story points on this thing, but you're going to have to go back to the Scrum Master and make it a five story point thing. So that rather than just attaching S3 full access to your um, you know, applications instance profile, you're scoping it down to just the bucket or just the objects or, you know, an appropriate condition key or something like that. Um, and then we can go and say, well, why do I have to do that? Well, you realize that using S3 full access is part of what got Capital One, a $100 million fine and 150 million credit card records somewhere on the dark web. Um, and they're like, oh, okay, yeah. I don't want to be the guy responsible for the $100 million fine. And so maybe as a, so we've got a couple of minutes left, Chris. Um, what what I love in, in, in you building that is that it forces you to focus on, on the attacker's point of view, right? When as practitioners, often we we are focused on the building point of view, right? What do we want to, to achieve? How do we want to improve our posture, etc.? So if, if you had one minute to share a couple uh, recommendations to the, the bunch of practitioners who are listening uh, this video, what would you uh, tell them? Get rid of your access keys, get rid of your access keys. And get rid of your access. <laughs> um, the, the, the number of times, and it, it's different places, but it all kind of comes back down to access keys, right? Whether it's access keys that were in GitHub, access keys found in S3, um, access keys found on an EC2 instance that got popped back from before instance profiles became a, a, common, uh, a common thing. Um, it really does seem like long-term access keys are the bulk of how, how these attackers get in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Capital One is more interesting case. It was not a access key. It was a server-side request forgery kind of proxy bypass. Um, but again, that, that went back to highly privileged roles. So again, avoid, especially in large multi-tenant accounts, uh, avoid broadly scoped permissions. Uh, if you're in an account and it's got one bucket, is S3 full access a, a bad thing? Maybe, maybe not. But you know, you're paying for the engineering costs regardless. Uh, you're either paying for the engineering costs in having a thousand accounts or in doing least privilege in your one account. Very cool. Thanks, Chris. Insightful and uh, and and really glad to get your uh, your uh, offensive uh, point of view. Thank you, yeah. thank you so much for uh, being with us today. We wish you the the best for for our cloud sake, and 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 we'll share obviously the recording links with uh, with everyone once uh, when this is released. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Mm -hmm.